Hello, Clinic Review family. I think you're going to like the video today. We're going to be doing respiratory prioritization. So we're going to be looking at best and first questions. A lot of first questions. I haven't done a lot of those before. And I'm also going to be using common sense in this as well. Okay. First, let me say thank you to all of our channel members. And if you are interested in paying me for something, you can go to clinicreview.com and sign up for my next gen small group tutoring. You do have to pay for that. And you can also at the same time or, or instead of, you can sign up for Mark Clinic's small group tutoring, or you can sign up for the Clinic Online On Demand Review, which is the best uh, NCLEX review in the universe, in my opinion. So let's go ahead and get started with our prioritization, respiratory prioritization questions. The nurse is caring for a client who has had a lobectomy and placement of a chest tube eight hours ago. When performing an initial assessment, which of this requires immediate follow-up? 200 mils red drainage from the chest tube over two hours. Client sleepy but able to be aroused. Three centimeters area of red drainage on the incisional dressing. Report of pain at the chest tube insertion site. So read the question, read the answers again, read the question again. The nurse is caring for a client who has had a lobectomy and placement of a chest tube eight hours ago. When performing an initial assessment, which of these requires immediate follow-up? So it's the initial assessment. That's a key word, y'all. This is the initial assessment and immediate follow-up. Those are the key words. So anything that says which would require immediate follow-up or which would you be most concerned about or which would you call the doctor about, all those mean the same thing. Whenever you see that word requires immediate follow-up, you say which of these is unexpected, Okay which of these is unexpected. That's why the initial assessment is key because which is unexpected at the initial assessment after someone who just had part of their lung removed and a chest tube placed. Okay. So you say to yourself, 200 mils of red drainage from the chest tube over two hours, is that expected or unexpected? Well, they did just have surgery. So you would expect there to be some drainage but I don't know that I would re expect 200 mils of red drainage over two hours. I might expect serosanguinous drainage. They did have surgery, so there's going to be some blood in there. So I would expect some serosanguinous, maybe even some more pink, you know, that's serosanguinous. But 200 mils of red drainage, I'm concerned about that because this is my initial assessment and they just had surgery. So I'm wondering if they're bleeding somewhere. And the keyword in the in that answer is red. If it said serosanguinous, I would not be as concerned about it. B, client sleepy, but able to be aroused. Well, they just had surgery. This is my initial assessment. So that's expected. Three centimeters area of red, red drainage on the incisional dressing. So three centimeters of red drainage. Well, that's not unexpected. They just had surgery. They may have leaked out a little bit. Some of the uh, blood might have leaked out onto the post-op dressing. So I do want to keep my eye on it, make sure it doesn't get more. There's not more, but immediate follow-up is not what's required. It requires some sustained follow-up, but not immediate follow-up. Report of pain at the chest tube insertion site. Well, that's expected. Do I want to do something about it? Yes, but it doesn't require immediate follow-up. you got to understand the words in these questions. Immediate follow-up means this is unexpected. That's what that word means. So the only one here that's unexpected, because I expect pain, I expect him to be sleepy, I expect there to be some drainage on the post-op uh, dressing, but I don't expect there to be 200 mils of red drainage from the chest tube over two, over two hours. That's a lot. It's red. It could indicate bleeding. They just had surgery. And this is my initial assessment. So A is the correct answer. And this is a prioritization question because it's asking you what is unexpected? What is the one that is your highest priority? What's the immediate follow-up? Which one requires you to call the doctor? Okay, question two. A client has just been admitted to the ICU after having a left lower lobectomy via video-assisted thoracoscopic surgery. Which of these prescriptions will the nurse implement first? Titrate oxygen flow rate to keep O2 sat at or greater than 93%. Administer two grams of cefazolin IV now. Give morphine sulfate four to six milligrams IV for pain or trans one, transfuse one unit of packed red blood cells over two hours. 
All right. A client has just been admitted to the ICU after having a left lower low back to be a video assisted thoracoscopic surgery. Which of these prescriptions will the nurse implement first? So here they give you a patient and then they ask you which prescription or which it could say, which order will you implement first? Whenever they ask you this question, they say, here's what's going on with the patient. Which order or prescription do you implement first? You always prioritize according to Maslow. And for clinic reviews, we talk modified Maslow. So the highest priority are objective physiological problems. Second is safety. And third is comfort. So we have to identify, according to the order, what does it address? So A addresses hypoxia, hypoxia, titrate the oxygen to greater than 93%. That addresses hypoxia. Hypoxia is an objective physiological problem. Two grams of cefazolin IV now. That addresses a potential infection. There's no actual infection. There shouldn't be. There's no actual infection. It's a potent to prevent potential infection. And so at this point, I want to address actual problems, not potential problems first. So I'm going to cross off B for now. Give morphine sulfate, four to six milligrams IV for pain. Well, pain is comfort. It's subjective, right? Anything subjective is comfort. So I already have a physiological objective finding in A, so I'm going to cross off C for now. Transfuse one unit of packed red blood cells over two hours. So that may be, let's say they're anemic. It doesn't tell us they're anemic, but let's say they are. That's why it's given. It's given for anemia. So it, we have two objective problems. We have hypoxemia or hypoxia in A, and we have anemia in D, even though they didn't tell us those were their problems. That's why you do those two interventions. So would it be a higher priority to address hypoxia or anemia? And in this case, we're going to go with the ABCs and we're going to say airway breathing and then circulation. So we're going to go with airway breathing first, which is A. Circulation would be D making sure they're perfusing with enough red blood cells, that would be D. So we're going to go with A as our top priority. I do have prioritization videos um, that are, they are labeled as prioritization videos where I teach these two strategies. Okay. I teach both of the strategies, the one I did in question one and the one I did in question two. I teach the strategies themselves. Three, the change of shift report has just been completed on the med surge unit. Which client will the oncoming nurse plan to assess first? So this is not what are you most concerned about. This is not which order will you implement first. This is which patient you will see first. So when you have four patients, four patients, you see the unstable patient first. So let's read through this and see who's unstable. Client with COPD who is ready for discharge but is unable to afford prescribed medications. Well, if they're ready for discharge, y'all, they are stable. Otherwise, they wouldn't be going home. So we're going to cross off A for now. We can come back to it if none of the other patients are unstable. But right now, we're going to cross it off because they're clearly stable. Client with cystic fibrosis who has an elevated temperature and a respiratory rate of 38 breaths per minute. Well, they're unstable. That's a very high respiratory rate. The temp is up. I'm concerned if they have some immune issues going on or an infection in addition to cystic fibrosis. I'm concerned about that. And don't say, well, 38 breaths per minute is expected with cystic fibrosis. It is not expected with cystic fibrosis. That is an unexpected finding. I don't care their diagnosis is cystic fibrosis. I don't expect their respiratory rate to be 38. So B is unstable. So I'm keeping there on my list. A hospice client with end-stage pulmonary fibrosis and an oxygen saturation of 89%. So I would say they were unstable except their hospice and hospice patients are, uh, they can be unstable and we don't do anything about it. That's why they're in hospice. So even though C is unstable because they're hospice, I'm not going to prioritize them. D, client with lung cancer who needs an IV antibiotic administered before going to surgery. So that's, I mean, we need to get that going, but it, they're not unstable. And we always see the unstable patient first. So don't say to yourself, well, I could just give them their antibiotic really quick and then they'll go to surgery and then I'll go see B. No, that's not how you answer these questions. You see the unstable patient first. So B is unstable and that's who we're going to see first. All right, question four. A client with acute exacerbation of asthma has been admitted to the medical surgical unit for treatment. The client is reporting increased shortness of breath with inspiratory and expiratory wheezes when planning care for this client. Which medication will the nurse administer first? So this is, I mean, it's a first question, so it is a prioritization question, but this one is one you just have to know. You either know it or you don't. Beta 
two agonists, uh, they're the ones that open up the airways. So short acting and long acting beta two agonists, they end in E-R-O-L, erol. So meterol and albuterol are the two beta two agonists that open up the airways. Ipratropium is not a rescue medication and fluticasone is a steroid. You sown drugs and in sown, that's a steroid. It's not a rescue medication. So we're going to choose between C and D. So salmeterol, they end in erol. It's a beta two acting, uh, beta two agonist. So salmeterol is the long acting one. Albuterol is the short acting one. It doesn't matter that it has a two after the end of it. Don't let that throw you off. Um, the correct answer is albuterol. Y'all, you got to know that. That's very fundamental nursing knowledge. Um, albuterol is always the rescue medication. And this person needs rescue, right? It's an acute exacerbation. You know it, it's rescue medication because it's an acute exacerbation. So we need to do the rescue med. All right, five, when caring for the client with chronic bronchitis, which of these interventions will assist the client in mobilizing secretions? Which of these interventions will assist the client in mobilizing secretions? Elevate the head of the bed 45 degrees, consume at least two liters of fluid daily, avoid triggers which cause coughing, or assume the tripod position. Okay, let's read it again. When caring for the client with chronic bronchitis, so that's the problem, which of these interventions will help assist the client in mobilizing secretions? So it doesn't sound like a prioritization question, but it is. It's the it's a best nursing action question. Best nursing action questions are prioritization. So which of these will, it doesn't say best assist the client, but that's what it means is wh which will best assist the client mobilizing secretions. So what we have to do is relate each one back to mobilizing secretions. Don't relate it back to just general respiratory, which one is helpful in mobilizing. So elevate the head of the bed, 45 degrees will help in mobilizing secretions. Well, I suppose would sitting up help mobilize secretions? I mean, I don't know. That's not, in my experience, that's not specifically helpful for mobilizing secretions. It helps to expand your lungs more but it's not specific to mobilizing secretions. So I'm going to cross off A for now. I'll come back to it if none of the other answers make sense. Consume at least two liters of fluid daily. Well, if I can thin out the secretions, I know it helps in coughing that up or mobilizing them. So B is a good option. I like B. And don't be afraid of two liters, y'all. The recommended fluid intake for a person on a, on a daily basis is two to three liters daily. So don't be afraid of two liters. Don't even be afraid of three liters unless they're fluid volume overloaded. Okay, if they're fluid volume overloaded, we're not gonna go up to three liters. But for a healthy adult with function, not healthy, but a, a, an adult with functioning kidneys, we don't need to be afraid of two to three liters. So I like B, avoid triggers which cause coughing. Well, that doesn't help mobilize secretions if I'm not coughing. I got to cough them up, so I don't like C. Assume the tripod position. So the tripod position is leaning forward. Will that help mobilize secretions? I mean, it might. Positioning, that positioning, might, I mean, it's better probably than other ways you can sit, but it's not a specific intervention for mobilizing secretions. So the only one that makes any sense is to consume two liters of fluid a day. And the only reason you wouldn't pick that is because you'd be scared of two liters. So you have to, don't be scared of that. Remember, two to three liters is the recommended fluid intake for an adult with functioning kidneys, okay? So don't be afraid of that amount of fluids. All right, question six. The client says, I hate this stupid COPD. What is the best response by the nurse? All right, so this is a question that really is a psych question wrapped in a med surge setting. So he's saying, I hate something or it, someone's expressing anxiety. I'm scared. I hate this. I don't know what to do about this. These are all psych statements. And so whenever you, the patient makes a statement and says, what's your best response? What it's really asking is what's most therapeutic. Now, you can only, you can only say that in a psych question. So don't say most therapeutic if it's a straight up med surge question, but this is a psych question wrapped in a med surge setting. So what we're really looking for is most therapeutic. And he's saying, I hate this. So what is a response to that? Stopping smoking will help your lungs heal. Well, the uh, that's not bad, but stop, it doesn't really address his concern, right? He hates COPD. And so we're saying, well, if you stop smoking, you're going to get over COPD. 
Well, it will help his lungs heal to some degree, but it doesn't reverse COPD because C, the C in COPD stands for chronic. So if I say stopping smoking will help your lungs heal, it may help their lungs heal, but it's not going to reverse the COPD. So it's a very misleading statement. It's not absolutely false, but it's misleading. So A is misleading. I don't want to say something misleading. You sound fed up with managing your illness. Is that therapeutic? Well, it's reflecting back to them what you hear them saying. So they say, I hate COPD. And you go, okay, what does that really mean? That's kind of reflecting back to them. You sound fed up with managing your illness. That is a therapeutic interaction, right? There's a therapeutic statement. So I'm going to keep B on the list. Does anyone in your family have COPD? I don't know how that helps him. And it's a closed ended question, which isn't therapeutic. So I'm crossing off C. Most clients get used to it after a few months. Well, that's a false statement. I can't imagine that's true. And even if it was true, it's not helping him out any. So the only one that's therapeutic here is to say you sound fed up with managing your illness. A reflection, clarification, that's appropriate to do. All right, question seven. The nurse is assessing a client admitted with status asthmaticus. So status asthmaticus is asthma attack that's not getting better, even though you'd kind of treat it. The nurse finds a sudden absence of wheezing in the lung fields and sets which of these as the priority action. Education to prevent future exacerbations, administration of a bronchodilator, measures to reduce anxiety, or activation of the rapid response team to secure an airway. So status asthmaticus is as an asthma attack that's not getting better with treatment. So I'm thinking the fact that it's called status asthmaticus tells me that it's been going on a while. And my guess, although it doesn't say this, my guess is they already took an inhaler at home or they've already tried an inhaler. Because if, if they haven't tried an inhaler, they can't call it status asthmaticus. Okay. Otherwise, they just go, well, they're having an asthma attack. But if they're treating it and it doesn't get better, it's status asthmaticus. So... All of a sudden, they have an absence of wheezing. So they have asthma attack that's not getting better despite treatment. And then all of a sudden, they have the wheezing they had is gone. That is actually a sign that, the, that their airways have closed off. It didn't say they now have lung sounds. That's not what it said. It doesn't say they now have lung sounds. It says they have an absence of wheezing. So what that means is, you're not hearing anything is what it means. You're hearing nothing, okay? So if you're hearing nothing, if their airway has closed so much, you have to activate the rapid response team. So the key word in this question is the term status asthmaticus and absence of wheezing. Those two words combined, status asthmaticus and absence of wheezing. When you combine those words together, it tells you they're not getting any air into their lungs and you need to secure the airway. All right, question eight. When caring for the client returning from thoracotomy and placement of a chest tube, the client reports severe pain. What does the nurse do first? Okay, so, all right, so they've got a chest tube and they're saying, I just had this procedure and now I have a chest tube and I'm having really severe pain. Oh man, it's really killing me. Okay, all right, what am I going to do? Assess location and quality of the pain. Call the rapid response team, check the patency of the chest tubes, or call the healthcare provider. So what do I do first? Okay, first. All right. So I like A. I'm not ready to do B first because they're having severe pain, but I don't have enough information to call rapid response. Okay, I don't know anything except they're having severe pain. So I, I just don't know enough. So I like A. I'm not ready to do B yet. I like C. And D to me is not first. This is a first question. So I'm calling off, I'm, I'm crossing off B and D um, as not first. Pretty confident those are not first. So the question is, do I want to assess the location quality of pain before I check the patency of the chest tubes? Or do I want to check the patency of the chest tubes before I assess location quality of pain? So they're both sort of assessment options, but I would rather know where the location and quality of pain is because if it's not at the chest tube site, maybe it's somewhere else, right? I don't even know where it's at. So why would I check the patency of the chest tubes until I know, at least know where the pain is and when it's occurring? Is it occurring with the deep breath? Is it occurring all the time? 
Is it at the chest tube site? Is it at the different incision site? Like, where is this, right? So I have to do A first. Otherwise, I don't really know what to do after that. I've had a lot of people say, well, you always assess first, y'all. You don't always assess first. If you have enough data to do something, then you do something. But if you don't have enough data to do something, then yes, you have to assess first. And here we don't have enough data to do anything. So we, yes, we do have to assess first. Okay, question nine. The nurse is evaluating and assessing a patient with a diagnosis of chronic emphysema. The patient is receiving oxygen at five liters per minute by nasal cannula, which finding concerns the nurse immediately. Fine by basal or crackles, respiratory rate of eight breaths per minute patient sitting up and leaning over the nightstand or a large barrel chest. All right. The nurse is evaluating and assessing a patient with diagnosis of chronic emphysema. So they've got emphysema is chronic. They're getting oxygen, which finally concerns the nurse immediately. So this is, this is the same question where it says, which would it require immediate follow-up? When you see the, the word immediately, whether it says you see a UAP doing something, which would require you to intervene immediately? When you see the word immediately in the question, that tells you there's something really wrong here, really unexpected. It's not the right thing, okay? So this is a patient with emphysema who's got oxygen going to five liters a minute. So which am I most concerned about? Well, I'm concerned about the unexpected findings. So what I expect someone with chronic emphysema to have fine by basal or crackles. Maybe, I mean, maybe, I'll, yeah, I guess so. I, I I, I'm more used to hearing wheezes. I'm not crazy about crackles. I'm going to keep that on the list in case something else is not more unexpected. Respiratory rate of eight breaths per minute. Well, that's super unexpected. I don't expect someone with chronic emphysema to have a respiratory rate of eight breaths per minute. That's definitely more unexpected than A for sure. So I'm crossing off A. I'm going to keep B. The patient sitting up and leaning over the nightstand. Well, that's that's expected with chronic emphysema. The, that's tripod position. They're sitting in tripod position. That's, that's something we teach them. We say, well, if you're feeling short of breath, sit in tripod position. So, okay. So C is expected. D, a large barrel chest. Well, they have chronic emphysema. So that's expected. So the only one that's not expected is a respiratory rate of eight breaths per minute. All right. 10. Patient with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, COPD. Tells the UAP that he did not get his annual flu shot this year and has not had a pneumonia vaccination, which vital sign change will be most important for the nurse to instruct the UAP to report. Okay, COPD, no flu shot, no pneumonia vaccine. Okay, what do we want to tell the UAP? They're taking their vital signs. And we say, hey, if you see this, tell me. Blood pressure, 152 over 84. Respiratory rate of 27. Heart rate of 92 or oral temp of 101.2. Okay, so I always want to have them report unexpected findings. So is a blood pressure of 152 over 84 unexpected? Well, it doesn't say he has hypertension, but it's not that high. Okay, that's like stage one hypertension. So I'm not that I I'm not that concerned about that right off the bat. Now, if nothing else is is more weird than maybe that one, but a stage one hypertension, I usually don't say, you got to report it to me right away. Respiratory rate of 27, that y'all, that's pretty high. I don't like a respiratory rate of 27. So I'm going to keep that on my list. That's tell me if the respiratory rate gets that high. Heart rate of 92, that's within normal limits. So I'm crossing that off. Oral temp of 101.2. Okay, that's abnormal. So unexpected. So B and D to me are both, well, A, B and D are all not expected, but A is, is not that concerning. So I'm crossing A off. So B and D. So am I more concerned in a patient with COPD who did not get their flu and pneumonia vaccine? Am I more concerned about a respiratory rate of 27 or an oral temp of 101.2? So based on the data that they gave me, I don't think this is an easy question, y'all, because I am concerned about a respiratory rate of 27. But based on the data that they gave me specifically, which was about not getting the flu and the pneumonia vaccine, I'm going to have to go with the oral temp of 101.2 because that indicates to me that they could be having the flu or it could be turning into pneumonia. Okay. All right. Well, I hope that helps you. Um, you're going to see probably 30% of your NCLEX is going to be prioritization questions. I hope it helped you. Um, the strategies I taught you here can be used for other questions. They, I'm any prioritization question 
over over any topic. These are all strategies that can be used. No matter the topic, if it's a prioritization question, you can use these strategies. So I hope you have a great rest of your day. Thanks. Bye.